Continuing our study of preclusion of judicial review, we turn to the case of Webster v. Doe. Doe was a CIA technician who was fired for coming out as gay. He sought judicial review of his dismissal. The agency argued that Doe was not entitled to judicial review. The relevant statute states, The Director of Central Intelligence may, in his discretion, terminate the employment of any officer or employee of the agency whenever he shall deem such termination necessary or advisable in the interests of the United States. In his discretion, he shall deem. The court notes that the statute fairly exudes deference to the CIA director. The court turns to the preclusion issue and analyzes it under APA section 701A2. We might ask, why aren't the statutory claims precluded as a matter of section 70A1, statutory preclusion? The court's discussion implies that section 701A1 did not apply because the statute had not affirmatively precluded judicial oversight. Of course, in Block v. Community Nutrition Institute, the statute did not expressly state that consumers could not have judicial review. But under Section 701A1, the court found clear and convincing evidence of congressional intent in the detailed statutory scheme. Why not here? Well, I'm guessing that in Block, the statute contained some language at least addressing judicial review, whereas here, in Webster v. Doe, there is no such language. The court goes on to characterize Section 701A to committed to agency discretion by law preclusion. The court recites language in Overton Park. This is a very narrow exception applicable in those rare instances where statutes are drawn in such broad terms that there is no law to apply. There might be law to apply, but still no review. In Heckler v. Cheney, the court writes, so that a court would have no meaningful standard against which to judge the agency's exercise of discretion. Here there is law to apply, Section 102 of the National Security Act. The director must at least deem that dismissal is necessary or advisable in the national interest. The director did so deem. Had the director not bothered to deem, then presumably the dismissal would not comply with the statutory provision and would be set aside. But suppose the deeming had been based on the employee's taste in neckties or baseball allegiance. Would there be no meaningful standard by which to judge whether the dismissal was arbitrary or capricious? The court seems unwilling to consider, but in any case, the preclusion is only partial. The court holds that Doe's statutory claims are precluded, but his constitutional claims are not. Justice Scalia, in yet another spirited dissent, argues that all claims should be precluded. Again, we see that the court is especially hesitant about precluding judicial review of colorable constitutional claims. Our next case, Heckler v. Cheney, is one in which the court found discretionary preclusion. The plaintiffs were death row inmates who challenged the FDA's refusal to require that lethal injection drugs conform to the same requirements the FDA imposes on drugs used by veterinarians. When the inmates requested that the FDA take action, it replied that it doubted it had jurisdiction. And in any event, were the FDA clearly to have jurisdiction in the area, the FDA said, we believe we would be authorized to decline to exercise it under our inherent discretion to decline to pursue certain enforcement matters. Generally, enforcement proceedings are initiated only when there is a serious danger to public health. We cannot conclude that those dangers are present under state lethal injection laws. Sincerely, the FDA. There seems to be quite a lot of law that might apply here, 
and possibly meaningful standards, but the court does not make a minute inquiry. Instead, it relies on a presumption, not a presumption of reviewability, but rather, it states, in cases of agencies' refusal to take enforcement steps, the presumption is that judicial review is not available. Where the agency action is a failure to enforce, the presumption is against rather than in favor of judicial review. The analogy is prosecutorial discretion in criminal law. Neither victim nor anyone else can compel an unwilling district attorney or lead prosecutor to prosecute. The only remedy is political, in case the prosecutor is elected, or executive in case the prosecutor answers to a superior officer. The court goes on to say, we emphasize that the decision not to undertake a certain enforcement action is only presumptively unreviewable. The presumption may be rebutted where the substantive statute has provided guidelines for the agency to follow in exercising its enforcement powers. The phrase, shall bring a civil action, did the trick in the Dunlop v. Bukowski case. But in Heckler, there was no similar shall in the statute. The court does drop a footnote, suggesting other situations in which the presumption might be overcome. Footnote 4. We do not have in this case a refusal based solely on the belief that the agency lacks jurisdiction, or a consciously and expressly adopted general policy that is so extreme as to amount to an abdication of, its agent, of the agency's statutory responsibilities. In this case, the FDA doubted it had a jurisdiction, but it also said it, it would decline to exercise jurisdiction if it had it. In a separate concurrence, Justice Marshall deplored the majority's creation of a presumption against reviewing agency non-enforcement. On the merits, a decision not to enforce that is based on valid resource allocation decisions will generally not be arbitrary or capricious. Instead, the court transforms the arguments for differential review on the merits into the wholly different notion that enforcement decisions are presumptively unreviewable altogether, unreviewable even to determine whether the resource allocation rationale is a sham. Heckler is a case of an agency not asserting its enforcement power. What about agencies that decline to use rulemaking powers. In Massachusetts versus EPA, the agency had received a rulemaking petition asking that it regulate emissions of greenhouse gases. The agency later issued a statement declining to promulgate a rule on the ground that a it had no jurisdiction over greenhouse gases and b even if it had jurisdiction, it would decline to make a rule in the face of scientific uncertainties. The agency cited Heckler. The court in Massachusetts versus EPA rejected the agency's reliance on Heckler's presumption of non-reviewability. Prosecutorial discretion when and where, whether to enforce is not the same as discretion not to rule make. The APA gives everyone the right to petition an agency to make, modify, or rescind a rule. And agencies are not free simply to ignore such petitions. Prompt notice shall be given of the denial in whole or in part of a written application, petition, or other request of an interested person in connection with any agency proceeding. Except when the denial is self-explanatory, the notice shall be accompanied by a brief statement of the grounds for denial. Justice Marshall, concurring in Heckler, thought Section 555E was pertinent in that case, too, where a petition for enforcement action had been made, and he thought the denial was reviewable for arbitrariness. Although he did not find the denial arbitrary or capricious, he was willing to apply that standard of review. Suppose we think tactically. In Norton versus Southeast Utah Wilderness Alliance, the Alliance's suit was ultimately dismissed as merely a broad programmatic attack, alleging 
general deficiencies rather than a failure to take some discrete action the agency was required to take. Could SUA have provoked some discrete action by the agency that was suitable for review? Query, if the statute can reasonably be read not to mandate an ORV ban in wilderness study areas, does it follow that a Bureau of Land Management denial of a rulemaking petition to ban ORV use would survive judicial review? I think not, no, especially if there is a record containing evidence that the ORV tracks in the desert amount to permanent roads. The agency is subject to judicial review under the arbitrary or capricious standard. Notice that agencies, although unelected, are accountable to the public in ways that Congress is not. Here's a challenge. Write to your congressperson to propose legislation and take him or her to court if the response you get isn't well-reasoned. And tell us how that works out. Of course, your suit would be dismissed for failure to state a claim. Let's look at one more case involving discretionary preclusion. In Lincoln v. Vigil, the agency acts, but its action amounts to discontinuing in-person services to handicapped Native American children. The services had been provided for years by the Indian Health Service, in an area having a very high concentration of Native Americans, the Four cor Corners region of the Southwest. The complaint alleged, among other things, that the decision to shut down the program and discontinue all in-person services was arbitrary and capricious. The court held that judicial review was precluded, not by statute, not because there was no law to apply or no meaningful standard, but because the agency action was committed to agency discretion by law. Justice Souter for the court wrote, Section 701A2 precludes judicial review of certain categories of administrative decisions that courts traditionally have regarded as committed to agency discretion. These certain categories include prosecutorial discretion, refusals to reconsider, national security dismissals, and allocations of lump sums. It is not too difficult to imagine how an allocation from a lump sum appropriation might be arbitrary and capricious. Consider this. The Indian Health Service decides to allocate its annual lump sum appropriation by lottery. The winning project receives 90% of the lump and all other projects share the remainder equally. I, I think, is this policy arbitrary, capricious? I hope you agree that a reviewing court might find that it is. But can an aggrieved party challenge the policy in court? After Lincoln versus Vigil, the answer seems to be no. The result of precluding judicial review is that agency illegality goes without a remedy in court. Koch and Dicey might not like it, but that's the APA.